What makes a high-performing virtual classroom? Is it my lessons? Is it me? Is it the resources that I use? Let's talk about it in the teacher's lounge. Welcome to the teacher's lounge. So we're talking today about what makes a high performing virtual classroom and how, what does that mean? It's talking about how do we help students think, process, and use the information that we disseminate, right? And we're now all in this virtual space with all of our ups and downs. And so I thought about a book by Dr. Ron Richhart and Mark Church and Karen Morrison. The book is called Making Thinking Visible. And I said, this would be great when we're talking about the virtual space. They talk about how to make ver um, thinking visible. And I wanna apply these concepts to the virtual classroom. So I wrote down a few things. They actually have six principles in the book. And I would highly recommend you all getting this book um, to get a deeper understanding because I am not going to go over all six. I really want to talk about two that they um, highlight. The first one is, it says here, and I have my little notes, okay? Because I don't have it all in my head. I am not that good. Fostering thinking requires making thinking visible. Thinking happens mostly in the head, especially in the virtual space. To be an effective thinker, you must make it visible through speaking, writing, drawing, or some other methods. Now, this book was published, Make, Making Thinking Visible. This was published in 2011, and they have a lot of great details. But let's go back to what they said. Effective thinkers, you must make it visible through speaking, writing, drawing, and other methods. How are we going to do this? How are we doing this in our virtual classrooms, right? And that's what I want to talk about today is how do we create that classroom culture, right? That classroom culture virtually that sets the tone for learning to take place. And everywhere everyone and educators everywhere are having their ups and downs with with making this happen how do we create i started thinking about it how do we create a positive virtual space and create a positive virtual culture that's a lot it gives me a headache now just thinking about it where is my tea i forgot my tea so let's get into it, educators. Let's figure out how we're gonna do this. And how, I'm just gonna share some of my personal stories and some of the things that I found through research and reading uh, different articles. And one thing that kept standing out to me with this is how do we build trust, motivate and encourage participation amongst our students, right? I thought about the first most important thing and I think we all struggle with this in the early days of the pandemic when we um, were sent home for us back in March of 2020. And my students got online and then we were finding out that not everyone had the digital, um, the technology that they needed to be successful. So I would say, first and foremost, in order for us to be successfully virtually, you need to assess your students' access to digital um, technology, right? To the, um, do they have laptops? Do they have iPads? Do they have any of these tablets that are out there? Do they have Chromebooks? Because I was finding out that a lot of students were using their cell phones. Now, that's not what we need to be do using to complete our assignments. Matter of fact, it's very frustrating. And in order for us to have these high performing virtual classrooms, we need to make sure that our students have the technology that they need. And a lot of districts around the country have stepped up 
right, and made sure that students have their um, laptops, they have hot, hot spots and all of that stuff, but it didn't start off like that. And then there are some districts and schools that are still struggling with this, okay? Um, I will talk about, you know, a few things when it came to making sure that my students had the technology that they need, because I'm gonna be honest with you, at first they didn't, some of them did, right? And so I would assign certain things and then I was trying to figure out, well, why was the turn-in rate so low? Then once I had to dig deeper and start having conversations with these students, realizing that they were using a cell phone to create the assignment, then I had to do it. I said, well, let me see what this looks like for them. Let me try. I know how to create this assignment on a laptop, but what does it look like trying to complete it on a cell phone? And I would say as educators, I know it's a lot of work right now, but I would say put yourself in the positions of your students and try to make sure that you do everything that you're asking them to do, you do it too, right? And that's the extra step that we've got to do until we can figure out what's going on and get back to something that's normal for us. So I tried to complete the assignment on my cell phone. Oh, yeah, I need, it was, it was, it was a lot. It was so much that I, I couldn't even complete it. And I said, okay, so this is what they're going through, right? This is, this is what's happening. This is why they're not turning it in. Because if I had to do this on a, on a cell phone, create this whole presentation, um, and it's taking me this long and I got seven classes, uh, this isn't gonna happen today. So I had started having conversations with those students, trying to figure out what, are the, what is it that they need. And sometimes they're not going to wanna share that information with you. You gotta think about it. Sometimes they're embarrassed to share that information, right? They don't want people to think that they don't have, right? That their parents can't afford things. And so they're not willing to just say, hey, can I get some of those Google Chromebooks and hotspots that y'all are passing out? Well, I'm embarrassed that I have to ask my teacher that or go to my school for something like that. So as long as you act with compassion and you uh, allow them to understand that you get it and you want to help them and it is okay to get a laptop from the school and you can return it later and you say this is going to really help you out and you sell them on the idea, man, they will really appreciate it, right? So I had to kind of change up the narrative a little bit and get into their shoes go through and be the example and see what needed to be done and modify, right? And have conversations with my students and letting them know that it's going to be okay if you need stuff right now. The whole world needs stuff right now. We're in the middle of a pandemic. So I would definitely say, find out what they need. And this is gonna help you with that virtual space. Once everyone has the items that they need to be able to complete your assignments. Um, what else do we need for a high performing virtual classroom? One thing that also worked for me is definitely creating clear learning objectives, clear learning goals for my students, allowing them to see the full scope of the assignment, the unit, whatever it is that we were covering, walking them through it first, kind of all the steps, all the activities we're, we're gonna do, what, what's the purpose of it, how is it gonna help them, and allowing them to kind of own their education, own that piece that's going to make them great. Let them see the steps, allow them to plan. They have more than just your class, right? So help them to understand what planning looks like. You have this, this, and this to do. You, it'll take you this much time to get this assignment completed, right? And after I walked them through those steps, they were able to own those activities. They were able to plan it out a little better and be great at it, right? And so I just wanted to make sure that they understood that because it's very important for them to understand the different processes. Um, 
we know that you are great educators at teaching, but we want to make sure that your greatness with their understanding is going to be what's going to equal success, right? And you'll have a better turnaround with your assignments and activities once they know. You got to think of it like this. We're in the middle of a pandemic. There's so much um, instability right now. You have some students that are taking classes at home. You have some students that are taking classes at their auntie's house. You, Their situations are not constant. So if we can give them that one piece, which is the ability to understand what is due for your class, it's going to help in the long run for them. Next, how are you delivering your instruction? Once we were sent home, and became these digital content creators, okay? Um, it was kind of like, we were kind of all over the place. We were, a lot of us, I mean, were suffering from depression. We didn't understand what was going on. We were afraid for our, our lives. We were afraid for our families. And so we were sent home and we became, you know, for our, our district, we became 100% online. And um, the district had to adjust and create um, create platforms for us to understand what this meant as a digital uh, space and what tools that we could use to be successful teachers. Well, a lot of teachers went to the virtual summer trainings, right? Where we were received so many different tools and resources for our classes. I mean, I thought I was gonna be a rock star the second that we came back to school. I said, oh my gosh, we gonna do this and that and this and that. Then I had to take a step back because I'm like, I am accessing all of these tools and resources for my students. What is the next teacher gonna do that they have? Are we all using different tools and resources to teach our classes? And what does that look like for the student to have to download all these apps access all of these programs, make sure it works with their laptop, make sure it works with their phone, make sure um, they can create a username and a password for all of these different accounts. That's going to be a mess. We're making them flip through hoops just to turn in a simple assignment. So I would say with that, it's going to take collaboration on the district's part. It's going to take collaboration with all the stakeholders, with your team members, your departments to figure out what tools and resources do we want to use for our students and how are we going to be consistent to make sure that we are not all doing several different things that's going to make it difficult for them to complete our assignments. If they have teacher one and the teacher one is using five different apps and then teacher two is using three different other apps, then teacher three and four and five are using a different thing. At the end of the day, what does that look like? That's not even expected as for, for us, right? Um, so we want to make sure that we are being consistent and understand what it is that they need and let's work together to make sure that we're not overwhelming them with all of these beautiful tools that we learned how to use, okay? Um, uh, I would also say just be, try to use the things that um, are required, like everyone has to be on a Zoom or a Google um, Hangout or or teams use that chat all right communicate with them through the chat allow try to make that fun and interesting for them i always have some kind of interesting question when they um, log into my classroom and have them posted in the chat and then we talk about it and we laugh about it and um it's just always fun and it's just it starts the mood it starts the classroom mood off great because we're literally laughing sometimes at the responses. And most of the time, mine is centered around food. Even though I teach entrepreneurship, I am, I, I'm a foodie. And my students know that. So we talk about food all the time. So um, uh, the other thing I wanna talk about is the debate with the cameras on and off when you're um, in your classroom. I get it. I absolutely get it, okay? You. We want to see our students and it creates a better environment when we can see all of our students and we can have those conversations. 
and but I do get it from the student's perspective as well for those who don't want to have their cameras on you got to think about some of their home situations right and um and I have some teachers well they can do a virtual background well some of those laptops don't work like that right it's just hard to create that and maybe they don't even know how to do something like that um it's it's one of those situations where once again we've got to put ourselves in their shoes some students are just so embarrassed with their home situation and they just don't want anybody to ever see what's going on and that's why they enjoy that camera off because when they used to come to school right they got on a bus and got to your classroom and didn't have to think about their home situation right and so they get that gave them a sense of peace well now I got to turn on my camera so you can see my mama back here and what she doing and she probably going to be checking the camera to see if I'm on my classroom. I have no sense of privacy and my little baby cousin is over here doing her Zoom classes and we're all in the same room and it's just loud and it's too much going on, right? Sometimes we got to kind of think about that. Those kids will try to do anything to avoid making sure that their teacher and their classmates cannot see the situations that they have at home to the point of if you tell me to turn on my camera and I was not prepared for that and I know I got so much going on in my background I'm gonna quickly exit that zoom meeting and send you an email miss teacher and tell you uh, my internet went out for a second you know it's happened you know it's happened okay so it's just think about it you know, I don't know the answer. I can't wait to see what the research says. I can't wait for the data to come out. I can't wait to see what other districts are doing to solve this problem. But um, it's there, right? Be creative. Um, send parents emails letting them know that we need the cameras on or if you don't want them to have it on all the time, but you at least want them to have it on during a presentation, give the student a heads up allow the parents to know your child created this great presentation and on Monday they're going to be presenting it. Could you make sure that the sound quality or the inf that the background or whatever it is their situation is allow them to be able to present without any distractions or disruptions. That's what we have to do. We've got to kind of think ahead and prepare in this virtual space um what else what else do we have i don't have all the answers guys uh but i just wanted to kind of give you a few tips on what it was to create a positive classroom em environment i think that once we pull all these resources together and i'm going to have more episodes about positive classroom culture this isn't it i think it's going to be a journey that we're going to have to take together you can always catch me on Clubhouse Tuesday. It's an app that you can use with your uh, iPhones, unfortunately, right now. And we will be on on Tuesdays at six o'clock where we're going to be talking about this very thing. So please join us and let's talk together. But some key takeaways today that I wrote down is definitely find out your students' needs. If you wanna have a, a high performing virtual classroom, you, we've gotta figure out what are they working with, what do they need, and how can my school provide that for them so that they can have that peace. Once they have that peace and they're taken care of, then it's gonna be easier for them to deliver what it is that you're asking. Next, give clear learning objectives. They need to own their education, right? They need to own what it is that you are giving them. They need some sense of um, consistency at this point because so many things are up in the air. So if you give them the clear learning objectives, you explain it, you tell them, it, you know, you give them your office hours, you let them know, well, if you don't get it, let's talk about it. Let's go into a breakout room and have a conversation about it. Let me help you to be successful. And they feel that from you, they're really going to try. Um, think about your delivery and the tools that you're going to use to make thinking visible, right? That's key 
in this whole process. We want our students to make thinking visible, but how are we going to do that? Are we going to overwhelm them with all the apps that we want them to download? Are we going to really plan with our teams to figure out what is going to be the, de the best tools for our students to use that will be something that they can access on their Google Chromebook? Does it even work, you know? And put yourself in those shoes. Make sure that all of the things that you're asking them, you've tested it out and you know that it actually works. Um, allow them to connect with you. Be pass be compassionate, right? And that's why I always start my classes off with something fun. My students don't know what version they're gonna get. I mean, sometimes I'm hat, yeah, I'm just where you might get on the Zoom and I'm singing. And they're like, oh my God, what is she, what is happening today? We might be singing. I might be rapping that day. I might, you know, we might have a fun question of, I might be talking about a restaurant that we went, that I ordered. We didn't, we're not going to any restaurants yet, guys, not yet. Um, uh, we just, you know, I connect with them in that, that, um, that level and they see that I'm human. And so they are more willing to share as well when they see that, hey, she's actually pretty cool. And you know, they are, they're giving me tips, okay? They're like, did you go try this, Miss Thompson? Or I cooked this last night, you might wanna test this out. I love it. And when you connect with them and you're compassionate, you're gonna have a better virtual classroom space. You, you just are. Everybody's gonna have buy-in. Your stakeholders, which is your students, are going to buy into what you're trying to deliver. Um, Keep being a fabulous teacher. We know that you are great. We see you thriving and we love it, okay? You just got to make sure you're studying, keeping up with the things that are going on, trying to you know, develop who you, you, who you are as an educator, find cool resources, collaborate with other teachers. That's the space that we're in. I am learning so much from other people that is just amazing. Keep doing that. We are going to have to be great together. Let's share and have a good time. That is all I have today for the Teacher's Lounge. Once you do all of that, you know what? You get your marker, you drop it, and you end that Zoom meeting, and you will be just fine. Thanks for tuning in to the Teacher's Lounge. This is brought to you by Paper Birch, which is an educational resource company designed to make sure our educators thrive. We have resources that you can use, some free and some you gotta pay for, but it's all to help you in your journey and in your story of being a teacher. Please tune in, we'll have a video every week. Subscribe to the channel. Find us on Clubhouse, find us on the social media. All of that is in the show notes. We look forward to this journey together and uh, see you next time.